people in Wichita had been terrorized by this bind, torture, kill individual for 30 years. He said, if you become my project and you have a routine, you're in trouble. I was all geared up to do something and it didn't happen at Project Green. Raider then moved on to a different project, Project Blackout, and again, no results. Dennis Raider, he was the master manipulator. In 1991, Raider was in his mid-40s. By this time, he had accomplished 10 murders without anyone suspecting him. I was building, I guess, toward the perfect murder. When I was writing the book about Dennis Rader, the serial killer known as BTK, one of the things he wanted me to have to use to organize it was his project list. Comprised of various people he had identified as potential victims. And that meant being very clear about when he attempted to kidnap somebody, when he stalked somebody and made contact. There were a number of young women during that time who he had picked out, who were on his list, who he was going to murder. I had like 55 projects. People were pretty close to meeting the hands of death. It didn't happen. The list had the project name, the years, the dates, the location all the details he could think of and fit onto this little chart. So it gives a, a lot of sense of his personality. He liked things organized, clear. He liked to follow rules because he wanted other people to follow rules. But that way he could then break the rules but come back into a safe, organized world. Project 16 on the project list was known as Project Blackout. My name is Cheryl Gilmore Sarkozy, and I'm a survivor of BTK. And his name for me was Project Blackout. Well, good morning. Hello, Dennis. I'm Dr. Katherine Ramsland, professor of forensic psychology and the author of multiple books about extreme offenders like serial killers. I've been corresponding with Dennis Rader to try to understand what led him to become one of the most notorious serial killers in America. This is the first time that Raider has explored these topics in depth with anyone. People call me a monster. I guess I am sort of a monster. The more information we have about serial killers, the more we understand what makes them tick, the easier it will be to prevent them. After the Dolores Davis murder, Raider slips back into a period of dormancy. He continues to look for projects, but he doesn't act out. What were you doing in those years when nothing was really happening? Well, I was a good father, husband, raised my kids, did a lot of things for them, did a lot of things for the community. I worked at church, you know, worked as scouts. Okay. But if I wasn't real busy, then I would go out on a prowling look for my next victim. They were basically projects. Did you feel like you were in control of your urges then? Yeah. I could always fantasize or look for more victims. That was part of the excitement, is being able to do the hunts. The planning for any sexually compelled serial killer is definitely part of the pleasure. And Dennis Rader is quite the organizer. In the project list, marked Project Blackout, Blackout refers to a bar near the campus of Wichita State University, where Raider would often go have a beer. Raider writes, girl at bar, and indicates the year 1977. Yeah, I was 26 years old at that time. One afternoon, a girlfriend and I decided to go to the blackout bar. And I started talking to this man, and he told me that he was studying at the university. It had to do with, like, police work and law. 
the bar got raided and everybody was told to leave. And so he was walking with me through the parking lot. I said, so tell me, do you know if it's against the law in Kansas to commit suicide? And he said, it is against the law. And I said, well, that's a shame because I think that anybody that wants to commit suicide should have that right. And he reached over and took my arm and he squeezed it and he said, oh, please don't say that. And I thought, what a kind man. By then I was at my car and I got in the car and left. He was really sort of a nondescript type of character. He wasn't someone that I gave a second thought to after that. But it turned out that that, that was Dennis Rader. That particular day, he had followed me home. And then he started stalking me. So I have a, a report from a, a woman named Cheryl. She said she talked with you at the Blackout Lounge. I used to go to that lounge. What I was trying to do was get more notches on my gun at that time. So I was in the mood. I had everything set, I had my hit kit, had rope, tape. I had two guns, a couple of knives. I was gonna do something. I was at the height of my uh, eruption. Cheryl Gilmore, Sarkozy's neighbor, was Dennis Rader's sixth murder victim, Shirley Bayan, who he killed on March 17, 1977. I thought it was the main target, and that didn't work out, so it was, uh, what's next? Uh, Shirley Bayan. It was totally impromptu. I didn't know exactly who lived in that house because I followed her son home that time. The day Shirley Bayan was murdered, I had a four-year-old son, and he had come to work with me that afternoon. When he and I got home, the whole neighborhood was filled with police cars. There was a knock on my door, and this policeman came in, and he said, the woman a few doors down has been murdered, and her little boy has said he saw the man knock on your door. So we feel that you might have been the intended victim. I can't imagine why anybody would want to kill me. It was a horrifying time in my life. And I nailed all my windows shut. I couldn't sleep for months. Had I been home that day, it would have been me instead of Shirley Vian. It certainly was possible that Raider would have had a number of other victims had things gone a little bit differently, had someone come home when he expected them to, had he figured out a routine of somebody in the right way. From the project list Raider shared with me, we can see that he continued stalking a number of people during the period of 1991 to 2005, but he just didn't succeed. At the same time, Raider worked as a Park City compliance officer, a job that once again gave him cover to stalk and troll in his own backyard. The uh, reporting parties of where the sheep were killed. A compliance officer, this is like a law enforcement equivalent, which is your grass is overgrown, your dog is off the leash, your house needs painting. He could kind of lord it over people and actually could carry a gun as part of the job. Did you like being a compliance officer? Yeah, I did. It's pretty close to what I wanted to be. You know, I'm a police officer, something like that. Serial killers who aspired to become cops typically had delusions of power. As I recall, several citizens called and made complaints about his being strict or rude, confrontational, and that type of behavior. As a compliance officer, he didn't like it if somebody did something he thought they shouldn't. So in his world, it was okay for him to break the rules, but he needed that safety of that regimented world so everyone else around him had to stay within their lane. 
January 2004 marked the 30th anniversary of Dennis Rader's first murders, the Otero family. It was 25 years since his last correspondence with police or the media, and it had been 13 years since he'd killed his last victim, Dolores Davis, although no one had yet linked BTK to her murder. When you have anniversaries, news departments do stories on it. So it was on the front page that a guy was writing a book about BTK. Well, BTK did not like that. He is so arrogant that he wanted to tell his story. I'm only going to be out there a little bit to be known, letting people know that I was still around. They thought I was maybe to die in prison or moved out of the area, or basically just passed away. When Dennis Rader learned that an attorney wanted to write a book about the unsolved BTK crimes, and he was gonna cover seven victims, and Rader knew there were more, so he didn't want a book written that would be his legacy that would really not get the story right. My administrative assistant goes through the mail every day, and she had gotten a letter that had a photocopy of what appeared to be an old Polaroid. It looked like a, a woman's body on the floor and a copy of a woman's driver's license. The driver's license was Vicki Wegerly's. Her murder had never been tied to BTK. Investigators believe the letter is from BTK because it has information about a two-decade-old homicide linked to BTK that only the killer would know. BTK claims in the letter that Vicki Wegerly was his eighth victim. No photographs had been taken of the victim at the scene by the police, by anybody, because Vicki Wegerly had been removed from the scene by an ambulance crew. So if there were any doubts in anybody's mind that this guy was the real thing, it stopped right there. It regenerated the fears of the citizenry there in Wichita. In your gut, you felt like, oh my God, whoever he is and wherever he lives, we got to stop this. A letter received by Cake TV was turned over to us last Wednesday, and we are treating it as a possibly being sent by BTK. In 2004, after the reemergence of BTK, the Wichita Police Department, under the leadership of Kenny Landwehr, who was the homicide lieutenant at that time, formed a task force made up of Wichita police detectives, FBI agents, KBI agents. I mean, I said, we're going to get this guy. I don't care what it takes. BTK is back because he wants to see his name in the paper. He wants to see him talked about on the television station. BTK is communicating again. BTK is back. BTK. BTK. This is one of the most challenging cases that I've ever been involved with. And I find that the individual that is doing this would be very interesting to talk to. Early on in the investigation, a couple of profilers from the FBI were brought in. And one of the greatest guidances that they provided was the creation of the communications that Kenny Landwehr would uh, release in these various media events. It all looked fairly natural the way Kenny delivered it, but these were scripted for the intent and sole purpose of keeping BTK communicating. If we could keep him communicating, that was the key to catching him. Eventually, he would slip up. When Ken Landwehr did a press conference about you, what was that like for you? Well, that was pretty high. He finally came out and said, yeah, BTK still exists in our community, so be careful. I was having a field day with cat and mouse. So I'm having fun. The strategy that Ken Landwehr adopted was to personalize this, to address whoever BTK was. The hope was that that would make the killer feel as if they were buddies, which is exactly what did happen. Raider really enjoyed it. So what started as a, an attempt to control his story turned into this game with law enforcement that he thought 
uh, they were having as much fun as he was. He has communicated with us since the 70s, and it continues today. Shortly after that, KTV got a letter that had one page, the BTK story, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, went all through the chapters. He suggests chapter names in talking about BTK. What killer does that? He wanted to give us a guide on how we cover him, basically. But the scariest thing was the very last chapter was just a question. Will there be more? Taunting police and Wichita, who was going to be the next victim, scared us all to death. Why did you decide to send the BTK story to the TV station? I wanted the police or the general population to know that, yeah, there might be some more. You know, I mean, it's not right off the sunset. There might be some more. We would get sent information. Obviously, we'd read it, we'd do a story about it, but immediately hand it over to the police department, hoping that maybe this will lead to his capture. In May of 2004, Dennis Rader sent a word puzzle comprised of random letters and numbers to Cake TV. It was obviously a word search, and the idea was that in this puzzle, there might be clues to his identity. Our responsibility was to find the words in the word puzzle. One was victim, one was serviceman, one was ruse. So we were in the newsroom looking at this puzzle going, oh my gosh. Hello, Susan. So nice meeting you, Dr. Ramsland, and thank you so much for shedding light on these puzzles. Well, he loved codes. That was his big thing. He loved codes and communicating through codes with just the idea of, now you have to figure me out. You have to be thinking of me. Why he chose these words, why some are backwards, some are forwards. What's this number, which actually should have that two, the zero to it, <laughs> because right. that's his address. Oh, <laughs> wait a minute. Where's his address? 6220. If you saw that in O, you wouldn't know that's a zero. Exactly. First of all, we didn't know at the time, right. obviously, of course. that the 622 and then the zero yeah, below do that? was his address. Right. Here it was that? here all the time. And then he puts address right down there. But that's the cat and mouse nature of it. The fun of it is he's going to take some risk in order to have some delight over how confusing this is going to be. And then he'll see that you won't get it. So he'll feel superior. Which I'm sure he did. He sent Cake TV most of the clues and the correspondence. Why do you think he sent it to Cake TV? He knew he was going to get publicity if he sent this to Cake. Yeah. And he loved the station because he watched it as a kid. He loved you particularly. I remember um, responding to one correspondence in particular where he said, I hope Susan's and Jeff's cold gets better. Two nights before I had just said on the air, Jeff and I have a cold, Jay. Can you give us some warm weather? Why do you think he did that? The Raider wanted you to know he was watching you. He was aware of you, alert to you, and he wants you to feel his eyes on you. That's so frightening. Yeah. Definitely. I was wondering, because you were so attuned to media at that time, whether you ever considered a media person as a project? Uh, not really, not really, although uh, that would have been something else if uh, I think Susan was really worried that maybe I was after her, but I really didn't have her to say. No, okay. I didn't have any media people at all. They were just using them to get things done, and that was the main purpose. He's having fun because he is watching this hit the news be talked about on TV, but he forgets you are a serial killer. This cat and mouse game is about real people that you killed. You're acting as if the police are playing a game with you and everybody's having a good time at it. And that is not what's happening. We were all concerned because we didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know if all of a sudden in the middle of the night, uh, BTK was going to sh show up in our bedroom.
Throughout 2004 until the beginning of 2005, Dennis Rader sent correspondence and items of evidence from his crimes to the media and police. He enjoyed the publicity, and he wanted to tell his story in his own way. Cake received another message from BTK about a cereal box that he had deposited at a home improvement store that wasn't that far from Cake TV. We sent immediately sent detectives to Home Depot, and they looked, didn't see anything, talked to all the employees about any packages they'd found. Investigators posted a message in the employee lounges asking if anyone saw anything suspicious. A guy came back from vacation and said, well, yeah, I found this cereal box in the back of my truck, and it said BTK bomb. Thought somebody was just messing with him. So he said, I just threw it in my burn barrel when I got home. Turns out that was the communication that Raider was referring to. So when we got the surveillance of the parking lot, that was our actual first sighting of uh, what we believe was BTK delivering that package. The video was blurry, and he's far from the camera, so police couldn't clearly see what he looked like. However, they did see that he was driving a dark-colored Jeep Cherokee. What about driving into the Home Depot parking lot? And you think they'd have a surveillance camera? Well, where I did my incident, where I put that stuff in the back of the pickup, there wasn't any cameras mounted on the light pole, so I knew if there was any cameras, they would be a distance. And I wouldn't be very distinguishing, mainly just a person. Dennis Rader's gotten away with this for 30 years, so there's a narcissism. We actually call this narcissistic immunity. The immunity part is the, the sense that he's so special that no one can touch him. But the narcissistic immunity is kind of well-earned because I'm one of the few serial killers that they haven't identified and never will in his mind. He asked to communicate with law enforcement directly. He was trying to find a way to do that without giving himself away. And so one of the things he suggested was to use a floppy disk. So at one point, he sent a message through the media saying, can I, can I communicate with you guys? And can we use a floppy disk? And you won't trace it. And then he specified, be honest. If it was OK for Raider to send the floppy disk without being traced, he instructed the police to respond in code through an ad in the newspaper that said, Rex, it will be OK. We thought it so ironic that a freaking serial killer wants us to be honest. Lieutenant Landwehr decided and the FBI decided to go ahead and place the ad and see what happens. And I wasn't really too nervous about it. I sent a lot of stuff to the mail and didn't have any feedback or any feedback from it. I guess I got confidence that they were sort of buddies or something or friends. I kind of had a, a little bonding with Landwehr. I think I kind of bonded with him. This letter is from BTK. And we thought they were wanting to play cat and mouse with me, which they were, but I thought they would be truthful. Raider had this kind of idealism he had developed ever since he was a Boy Scout and his hope to become a police officer. It had this kind of John Wayne thinking going on that, you know, they're upholding the law, so of course they're not going to lie to him. He answered with the floppy disk. The floppy, was it just a test file on it, or was there anything else on it? No, that was it. This was just a test. I okay. wanted to see if they would pick up on it or to get through OK. Is there wasn't anything beyond that. This is a test. One of their IT guys there at the Wichita Police Department loaded it into his computer. He began pulling metadata files, showing prior users of that disk. Immediately, there was an indication that it had been used at Christ Lutheran Church up in Park City. Also, the name Dennis appeared. Real quick check, the president of that church was a guy named Dennis Rader. That was a huge break. That was one of those moments where you were just ecstatic. We found an address in Park City, and the race was on. We all wanted to get there. As soon as they get the location where Dennis Rader lives, two of our detectives are on it. And their sets 
the type of vehicle that was used by BTK to deliver the package to Home Depot. We wanted to just go knock doors down and, and go in and get him. The lieutenant said we don't have his DNA to confirm that this is in fact the BTK killer. We didn't arrest him at that point, but he was placed under surveillance 24-7 because the last thing we'd wanted was for him to go out and try to victimize somebody after we had already identified him. With DNA testing, forensic scientists can link criminals to crime scenes, something that was unavailable to police when the BTK killer first terrorized Wichita, Kansas in the mid-70s. We had DNA from the Otero case and several other cases. At this point, you've got DNA analysis. When BTK was leaving all that evidence behind, it was worthless. It couldn't be analyzed back then, but technology had caught up. Were you worried about getting caught during this time, that they might trace something back to you? Yeah, I was real careful with my uh, fingerprints. I didn't even think about my semen. They would have had to save that, what, 30 years? But they also had a DNA sample from Fox, Hank Wagonley. She had some scrapings underneath their fingernail for me because we did fight. Well, we began to mull over the idea, how do we get his DNA? And I happened to notice that his daughter had gone to Kansas State University. Let's get a court order and see if they've got any records. Sure enough, they had records of her. The records indicated that she had had a pap smear. We're able to take possession of that sample. Then we began to wait for the analysis. I got a call that following Monday from the examiner and she said, uh, that sample you submitted, that person is the offspring of BTK. Those were words that I had waited and hoped we would hear eventually. That's pretty definitive at that point. It was very exciting. I can only imagine for the Wichita guys who've been living this case every day and night for months and years, that had to feel incredible. Following the findings of our forensic laboratory, number one on that priority was the arrest of Dennis Rader. There were a number of people in the arrest team, all of the task force, plus a couple of uniformed officers. We got word from the surveillance team that Dennis Rader, or BTK, was on the move. He was leaving his office and was likely headed home. And so we were set up along his route home. The decision was made that once he passes, that uniform car will execute a traffic stop on him. When the uniform car stopped Dennis Rader's truck, I had kind of beat feet as quickly as I could move up uh, because Dennis was coming out of his, his, his door popped open fairly quickly. But before he was able to get out, I grabbed him and introduced him to the concrete. I was joined by several of my colleagues who had every kind of gun in the world pointed at him. They got him handcuffed and we stood him up. When he turned to me, we were maybe a foot apart, looking eye to eye looks at me and says, uh, would you mind telling my wife I won't be home for lunch? I assume you know where I live. Just calm as calm can be. We escorted him back to the transport vehicle. He stuck his head in the door. He says, well, hello, Mr. Landwehr. So and that was all he said. An immediate recognition and knew who Kenny was. We scooted him in the car. I jumped in next to him, and we took off for our interview location. Let's talk about when you did get caught. It was a huge effort. What was that like to be in the middle of it? They had helicopters and all kinds of stuff around. Anyway, when I pulled off to go down that side street, they were all lined up on the street. And I thought, what are they there for? Could it be me? And then as soon as they appeared in the mirror, you mirror, I knew, uh oh, I couldn't figure out how they knew. I first thought they made the connection when I dropped off my floppy in a mailbox. And that's what really threw me, because how can you hear that with no cameras or anything? Right. So I thought I could get out of it. And I talked to her, Mr. Landwehr. He said, you know why you're going downtown? And I said, I've got an idea. And I think that kicked it off right there. One of the things the FBI profiler that was interviewing him with Lieutenant Landwehr made him say, it was very specific, he said, tell us who you are. Tell us who you are, Dennis. And eventually, he would say, I'm BTK.
During the initial interview process, Kenny Lamware was in the room with Dennis Rader and laid the floppy disk on the table to, to get his reaction. That's the way the when you asked them to tell you if the floppy oh. could be traced, why did you trust them? I like the scout oath, always be truthful. I just be trustful. But they had declared war on me, and wars are not nice things. I actually felt like they should have given me more respect, I guess, uh, playing her cat and mouse game. To this day, when Raider talks about that, he still can't believe the cops lied to him. He had got a degree in administration of justice, and he would know that interrogators use lies all the time because they're trying to catch the bad guys. So there's an odd childlike naivete at play here. How could you have ever betrayed me like that? Dennis even felt, you know, that since he wore a badge and uniform, uh, that we were kind of in the same group, and that we were all in the, the law enforcement uh, world. Why did you finally confess during the interrogation? They talked about the DNA, so nowhere along the line was they going to be able to escape that. So that was the final link. I was caught with anything else to do, to be honest. Cooperated in all the cases, including the two that the county detectives had, which were the Dolores Davis and Maureen Hedge, who were disposed of in, in their territory, their jurisdiction. For decades, it's been speculated BTK was responsible for more murders the 1991 murder of Dolores Davis and the 1985 murder of Maureen Hedge. When Dennis Rader uh, was asked about the possibility of his family knowing that he was BTK, uh, he did not feel that they ever had a clue. On the day that Dennis Rader was arrested, Detective Kelly Otis and myself talked with his wife. She was, of course, in shock, in complete denial. Complete denial. She said, no, no, no. Said, you've made a horrible mistake. She was not going to believe this. Although she was putting on a brave face, you know that she had to be, her mind had to be just whirling and, and wondering and worrying and, and thinking back over their marriage. Is this a possibility? Well, one time I was spelling, just, uh, I think I was writing something to the church or something, and I was using her computer, doing newsletters and back and forth. And she says, you spell just like PTK. I go, whoa. I said, yeah, I've always been bad on spelling. He was manipulative enough to keep them in the dark. As much as it, I say sick to my stomach, I was sick to my heart. I don't know that the dentist that I thought I knew exists. I did interview his son. He said, we lived the perfect Leave it to Beaver life. He said, we went on vacations. Dad was involved in our sports and our activities. In the church, we had great time at home. He said, there's nothing. But, uh, the day he was arrested is basically the day he will mark forever as the day he died. He was like my best friend that I walked the dog with and I was very close to him. And so when the FBI showed up on my door, you know, February of 2005, like I, did, I told him they had the wrong guy. I tried to alibi him and um, I was just fell into physical shock. My whole world just fell out under me. When you were arrested, did it occur to you that people who looked up to you were how they were going to feel about that? Devastated. I can't believe that. You know, wow. Dennis has been arrested. What? What happened? How? Yeah. You know, I'm sure that crossed their mind. I was very, very depressed on that. You know, that, uh, well, first of all, I didn't think I was ever going to get arrested. So, you know, you just keep going and keep going. So, you never think that would ever happen. He never thought he'd be caught. So, he really didn't think about what it would be like for them to find out their father or their husband was a serial killer. So if you consider that love is being able to think about what benefits the loved one, then you would say Raider's love, whatever it means, does not run very deep. Today is a very historic day. The bottom line, BTK is arrested.
The day Dennis Rader was arrested, I'm in a shopping center. I hadn't gone into work yet. My boss calls and he goes, we're almost positive BTK has been caught. You need to get into work right away. No lie. The whole room, the whole shopping center started spinning. The blood rushed from my head down to my toes. And I sat down and said, I'm going to faint. And then I started crying. I just cried and cried and cried. And I think I had much the same reaction as a lot of women in Wichita had. And that was such a sense of relief. Glad I got the son of a bitch. And then my mom can rest in peace. Come across TV, you know. I said, somebody right there. Kill my mom. How did I know? Unless I remembered what he looked like. He kills me now, every day. It was, it was very, very uh, tense time. Um, I didn't know how to feel. I wanted revenge. I wanted, I wanted to get my hands on this guy. Raider tells us he had most of what he called the mother load of evidence in a two drawer file cabinet located in his compliance office at Park City. When we were there, it was unlocked. There was a key to lock it up on top, but it wasn't locked. So he was pretty comfortable, I guess, that it was safe there. He had everything categorized, indexed, and they're in order. Kept all the originals of any correspondence of all the, the artifacts that he was collecting. He would mark them with dates and times. The level of organization was remarkable. At this time, I'm going to ask, how do you plead to these 10 counts? Guilty. All right, are you pleading guilty because you are guilty? Yes, are sir. You? All right, Mr. Rader, I need to find out more information. Well, what I mean, I, 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 I strangled <laughs> Mrs. Otero. He was sentenced to 10 consecutive life sentences. The death penalty for his cases was not on the books. And so we really never had a discussion about the death penalty being possible. He was fully aware that he was never going to see freedom again. I think that we, in the media and in the community, really fully understood the damage he had done when you could feel that sense of relief that he was off the street forever. In the courtroom, families of some of BTK's victims got their first real look at the man police believe killed their loved ones. This changed these young people's lives 30, 25 years ago, and they've lived with that ever since. The criminal actions of Dennis Rader caused irreparable damage to the very fabric of my blood family. He caused me to challenge my faith, change my future forever, yet I have never allowed his actions to send me to the dark side. Nancy Fox is my sister. Nancy's death is like a deep wound that will never, ever heal. I'd just like for him to suffer for the rest of his life. I'm Jeffrey Davis, son of Dolores Davis. For the last 5,326 days, I have wondered what it would be like to confront the walking cesspool that took my mother's precious life. Not only were we united as a family of survivors, we were kind of representative of the family of citizens of the community who had literally lived in terror at times. You have to live with the cold reality that while all of us here will overcome your depravity, you have now lost everything and you will forever remain nothing. His wife requested an emergency divorce and I think it's probably the quickest divorce in history, it's probably less than five minutes. I don't think she's ever looked back. Uh, I don't think she enjoys being in the public She's never been interviewed. Paula and the kids became Dennis's victims. I can't imagine the price that they've paid. Uh, my heart. I can't imagine.
measure. This is now Dennis Rader. No longer in a courtroom suit, but a prison uniform. This is likely the last time you'll ever see the serial killer again. Pretty soon it'll be a black hole. I won't be here. I'll be gone. I've accumulated a lot of deaths, a lot of hurt and shame on my family and everything. And it's kind of like things have been sucked into me or I'm basically in a black hole. One of the things I suspected about Raider there were things different about him than the typical things we know about serial killers. The fact that he was a family man, had a full-time job, seemed to be a regular guy with an ordinary childhood. It impressed upon me the importance of studying people who don't fit the mold, who break the stereotypes. We need to be very clear that there are no formulas because I think had we been like that back then, Raider would have been caught sooner. I think it's an irony that everything about Raider is control, and yet he's in a prison cell 24-7 with guards deciding when he gets his meds and his food and gets to have a shower, etc. He's totally under our control.